Welcome to the Washington Heights Church Podcast. We're so glad you're here. Each week, we bring you the latest Sunday message filled with God's Word to help strengthen your faith and deepen your walk with Christ. Whether you're tuning in from home, your commute, or anywhere in between, we're thrilled to have you join our community. So grab a cup of coffee, find a cozy spot, and let's get started. So here we are in the middle of that incredible season that we call Love Gives, where we have an opportunity every week to be a part of something that is outside of ourselves, part of something bigger than us, part of something that God is doing. And what we're looking at in these weeks leading up to Christmas is the heart behind that, the motivation behind it, which we really believe is expressed in the heart of God. But here's the thing in the holiday season. You know, it's supposed to be a season of great joy, right? But here's what I've discovered over many years of journeying, you know, through seasons like this. Not everybody's real joyful. And one of the reasons for that is because where we find ourselves is not where we wanted to be. And this world has a way of doing that. And we often think that, you know, if I could just change my circumstances, there'd be a whole lot more joy, and that's just not where we are. I've also discovered, you know, that as people journey through life, we can wind up in some hard places that we never intended to go. Nobody who winds up addicted set out to get there. Nobody who winds up divorced set out to get there. And that list of where we find ourselves versus where we thought we would be is a really long list. And so I don't know if there's a measure of that in you or you're just in that place where you're like, yeah, I get what season it is, but I'm not sure there's a whole lot of joy. And maybe it's because of an idea like this that how can I experience joy when life has not gone as planned? And if you would look at yourself right now and say, this is not where I thought I would be. You don't have to be really old to have that feeling. Right? You could be at Weber State and feel that way. You could be anywhere in your journey and feel that way. Well, part of the Christmas story includes that kind of experience and that kind of feeling and that kind of emotion. And today, what we're going to look at as a part of the Christmas story is a story of the parents of somebody who is a key player in the life of Jesus when he comes. But it's not Jesus. It's actually the one who would prepare the way for Jesus. Prophets, hundreds of years in advance, predicted that Jesus would come just as he did. Well, he was not the only one who was predicted to come. The one who came before him was also predicted. His name is John the Baptist. And so we're going to look at his parents and their journey through that experience. And when we pick up the story, this is where they are, wondering, God, what are you doing? And and including in that story this idea that, God, we've been really faithful to you. Why have things not turned out the way that we thought? Why have our prayers not been answered? And so if you can feel any of that or you know what any of that is like, know that this story is your story. And it's part of the Christmas story. It's a story not just about where we get to, but how we get there. So let's jump into the story. This is in one of the Gospels, The Life and Times of Jesus called Luke. In the time of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. So Luke is somebody who was very concerned about a lot of the details and about the reality of this story. His account, and really all the gospel accounts, don't read like fairy tales and say, well, once upon a time, you know, in a kingdom far, far away. Luke sets out to interview the eyewitnesses, and he includes a lot of the details here that are a key part of the story. And here he's telling us, Zechariah and Elizabeth, they have the right bloodlines. They are in these families of priests that have been priests for generations. Now, both of them were righteous in the sight of God and observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. Anybody want to take that for themselves and say, yeah, that's me? 
I don't know about you. I'm not taking that. But here's what Luke's trying to tell us. These are good people. You know, these are the people who are doing the right things in the right ways with the right motivations. They are faithful people, but they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Now, in our day, we don't think a lot about, you know, a stigma attached to that, but there was in that day. That if you could not have children, there was this spiritual interpretation that said God was trying to send a direct message to you, and if you were not blessed with a child, it is a judgment of some form or fashion. So imagine walking around as Zechariah or Elizabeth, everybody else, you know, pretty much has kids, you don't, and people, you know, can assume this. We don't know exactly what the problem is, but it's obvious that God is judging you in some way. Not sure what's wrong with you or what you have done, you know, that has displeased God. But we know that he doesn't really affirm you or favor you. It was also an economic thing because there was no social services back then. So to be cared for in your old age came through your children um, who would do that. So to be without children was to be greatly at risk. And so as we encounter this couple at the beginning, they are faithful, they are old, and they have been in a place where most people would say nobody wants to wind up there. And they have clearly not experienced God's favor. Story goes on. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as a priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. Couple things going on here. One time a year, one priest was selected to go into the most holy place of the temple. And that was such a serious thing that nobody else went back there. And there was a big curtain that was, you know, kind of uh, cautioning that off there. And sometimes they would even tie a rope around the ankle of that priest because, hey, if he keeled over in there, nobody goes in. We'll just pull him out, you know, and, and bring him back on this side. Well, how did they decide? Historians tell us that at this this time in Jerusalem, there were about 18,000 priests, and they were divided up into 24 different divisions, and we saw the name Abijah before. That was one of the divisions. Zechariah belongs to the division of Abijah. There were 700 priests in each division. That's a lot of priests, and we don't know exactly how this plays out, but when it talks about lots and casting lots, it was like really a roll of the dice. And where the dice landed, that's the person who was chosen. And out of 700, which is a small subdivision of 18,000, the lot falls to Zechariah. I mean, he's there literally by a roll of the dice. And when the time came for the burning of incense and all the assembled worshipers were praying outside, then an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense. Now, Zechariah's thinking, you know, I'm here by chance, but God has in mind a divine appointment that's on the other side of that. And when Zechariah saw him, the angel, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. Now, that name is going to factor into the story a little bit later. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will, is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Even before he is born, he will bring back many people of Israel to the Lord their God. Now, those words for us are not that familiar But these are electric words, and Zechariah would have known them. Here's the rest of it. And he will go on before the Lord, prepare the way for the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Again, we think, well, that's great. Those words are beautiful. They are the last words that are recorded for us in what we would call the Old Testament. There's a book called Malachi, or as some have termed it, the Italian prophet Malachi. And in the back of that, right at the end, those are the final words. It's an actual quote from the end of the Old Testament. 
And when those last words were recorded in Malachi, you know what happened next? Nothing. For 400 years. The gap between the end of the Old Testament and these words here. Dot, dot, dot. 400 years. But now what God is saying in this moment in time is we're picking up the story. And here's the guy who's there by a roll of the dice who has been waiting for something for generations, for decades in his own life to become a reality. And that prediction was about the one who would prepare the way of the Lord. So there was this coming Messiah and there was going to be somebody who would go before him who would prepare the way, who would declare and announce his coming. Somebody, it wasn't about him, but he was part of that story in a significant way. He was going to be one who would ultimately say, he must increase, Jesus. I must decrease, John. When Jesus walks up one day, he says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, I'm not fit to tie his sandals. Well, where did that guy come from and from whom did he come? He came from these parents who had been waiting a long time. When we get into difficult places and we get into the place where we think life has not turned out the way that I thought it should turn out, it's real easy for us to buy into some lies. And it's really important for us to hold on to some truths. Well, what are some truths to hold on to? I think there are some that come right out of this story. Zechariah and Elizabeth tell us it's not too late. It's not too late. They think that their best shot at the best life that they could have has, you know, passed them by. And maybe you feel the same way. Maybe you think, you know what? My best shot at having a great marriage has passed me by. But with God... It's not too late. Maybe you think your best shot at giving a great example to your kids has passed you by. And you look and you see a lot of mistakes that you've made and things you would like to take back and words you wish had never been said. But with God, it is not too late. Maybe you think your best opportunity to find a spouse who loves the Jesus of the Bible and the things of God has passed you by. But with God, it's not too late. Or maybe you think that there's a dream for your life. And you might as well give up on that dream because it's not happening anymore. With God, it is not too late. And it's real easy for us to give up when we think that it's too late. With God, it's not too late. Another principle out of this story is that this is not wasted time. The time of waiting and the season of not seeing those prayers answered, we can easily think, well, that's just a waste. There's no positive outcome to this. But remember who John the Baptist was going to be. He's not the coming Messiah. He's the one to point to the Messiah. He's the one to announce his arrival. He's the groomsman, not the groom. Well, what kind of environment would produce somebody like that who wouldn't take that opportunity to say, yeah, I'm the man. No, he says he is. Could it be that he was raised by parents who knew what it was like to wait for decades and to wonder if God's best had passed them by, but then all of a sudden they had the opportunity to participate in what God was doing, and they were just overjoyed at the opportunity to be a part of something bigger than themselves, to raise a son who would say, yeah, it's not about any of us ultimately, it's about God, but we get to be a part of what God is doing. And John was that man. Jesus, on one occasion, said he's the greatest person who's ever lived till this point in history. Incredible. So the time of waiting is not wasted time. It is often a time of preparation where God is working to set you up for what is next. And what is next with him is good. So this is not wasted time. And then also, you were not here by chance. How easy for Zechariah to say, well, it could have been, you know, Joe or Bob, you know, who got on in there. But, you know, what do you know? The dice fell to me, the roll of the lot. And, you know, I'm here by accident. No, you're not. 
and God was in the details of that moment. I think it's real easy for us to think things, you know, in the same direction. We go, this is not the job that I want, it's the job I had to get, you know, so I'm here by accident. No, you're not. Or there's some circumstances that have unfolded a certain way and it was beyond your control and you think, well, that's just the way it is and it's random and it just doesn't seem like there's any purpose to it. Yes, there is. That in a relationship with God, you are not here by chance. And that can mean in your life out there, it could maybe even mean in this very room today or watching online right now. You are not here by chance. God is in the details. And there are many divine appointments that are on the other side of what seems to us to just be random moments of life without purpose and without plan. Story goes on. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is... This is a wise man in this moment. <laughs> yeah, I'm really old, but my wife, she's well advanced in years. This is the voice of experience there. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. I don't know about you. I love his response. And you know why? Because I think it is so human. And it is so normal. And there are many times when we, you know, maybe come across things that God has revealed to us in the Bible and we think, yeah, but how can I know? How can I be sure about this? And maybe you try to keep those doubts or those questions pressed down because you think, man, if anybody knew about that, and certainly if God knew about that, he wouldn't be real happy with me. Can I just say, God already knows. And wouldn't it be great to be in an environment where it's okay to bring your doubts and your questions? And to know and understand that God can be at work and you can join him in what he's doing. And you can ask questions on that journey. And you can bring your doubts along with you. And you don't have to have them all answered in every form and fashion. Ask your questions. Bring your doubts. And follow the God who's at work in some times and ways in which go far beyond our understanding. When you come to an infinite God, there are going to be some questions. And there are going to be some doubts. And, you know, I'll just confess this to you. Many people struggle with their doubts about God. I don't. But I struggle mightily with doubts about myself. And you might be on one side of that equation or the other. Or maybe a mixture of both. But I love Zechariah saying, how can I be sure of this? Well, you know what's going to happen to him? He's going to get a time out. He's going to lose his voice for the next nine months. And the angel takes that away from him and says, and now you will be silent, and not be able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true when? At their appointed time. At their appointed time. And so a human being who has journeyed for decades not seeing the prayers answered, who has been faithful. And isn't it easy for us to fall into this category where we think, if I'm faithful to God and I show up for the deal and I do my part, God is going to do his part. And how many times do we feel like we're doing ours, but God is not doing his? And so, of course, he would ask that question and wonder, how can I be sure? How can I know? God's plan is not always the plan that we have. But here's somebody who brings a question and brings some doubts, and God is going to continue to journey with him, and Zechariah is going to respond and journey together with God. Let's fast forward nine months here and a little bit later in Luke chapter 1. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day when they came to circumcise a the child, they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. That was the normal custom. Every son was named after his father, at least the firstborn son. But his mother spoke up and said, no, he is to be called John. They said to her, there is no one among your relatives who has that name. 
very unusual and very much outside of the normal custom of the day. Then they made signs to his father, he's still in time out, to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet and to everybody's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Immediately his mouth was open, his tongue set free and he began speaking, praising God. And there's joy. And we might say, yeah, well, he's joyful and he's praising God because he got what he wanted. And I would submit to you, no, he is joyful because he recognized that he was a part of something much bigger than himself. And that God invited him to be a part of something incredible that he was doing in this world. So how do we take steps to getting unstuck? Because many times when we think life has not turned out the way that I thought it should turn out by now, we can be stuck in that place and stuck in our doubts. And let me put a couple steps of action around what we've already talked about. A step of faith and obedience and courage. Because the principle is that it's not too late and that you're not here by accident and this time is not wasted. They're pretty general. But what if we attach some steps of action to each one of them that could lead us forward and especially if you've been stuck in a place for a long period of time? What do I mean by that? Well, here's the first one. It's not too late to take a step of faith. Right? Zechariah had his doubts. And I wonder if even he wrestled with those doubts. God, I've been praying for decades. I've been faithful to you. Wrestling is often something that produces a stronger faith. And doubt is not the opposite of faith. The opposite of faith is unbelief. And wrestling with our doubts often produces a much stronger faith in the long term. But here's the key to it. We need to wrestle with it, not just check out. When we wrestle with it, what does that mean? Ask the questions. Find the input. Pursue the answers. But wrestle with it. But what can happen? Is it, you know, the worst case scenario? That we just sit in our doubt. And we don't do anything about it. And we just let it fester. And I think that can cause us in many ways using it as kind of a metaphor to lose our voice. Our voice about who God is, our voice about what God is doing in the world around us, in the lives of the people that matter so much to us. And that just kind of shuts down and goes silent. And so bring your doubts and ask your questions. And you can journey with God along with those questions and doubts. It's okay. And Zechariah is just one person of many with whom God continued to journey, who was saying, but how can I know? How can I know for sure? Another way to get unstuck is this, that this is not wasted time if you practice obedience. So God, for some reason that we don't know and understand, says, name him John. There's nobody in the family. We read that. And so to name a child outside of the normal custom was just unusual. And it's not as if God says, hey, and name him John, and here's the reason for it. He just says, name him John. And so what do they do? They name him John. (laughs) And I think many times our obedience might work this way where we say, you know what, God, I will gladly take that step of obedience when you explain yourself when I understand for sure exactly why you are doing the things you're doing and what you're inviting me and calling me to do. But can I just suggest to you that many times faith works the other way around. We think understanding has to come before steps of obedience. This story tells us, you know what? Obedience can be a gateway to much more understanding than we ever find before taking that step of obedience. God, why would you call us, you know, to act a certain way in this culture, in this time, when nobody in their right mind thinks this way? And God invites us to trust him and take a step. You know, for example, in the New Testament, the book of Acts, there's a line that says, better to give than it is to receive. And I would suggest to you that we don't know that that is really true until we do it 
until we take a step of obedience. We think, let me understand first, then I'll take the step. I truly believe that in our day, we do not lack for information or knowledge. What we often do lack is obedience, is taking steps on what we already know and what God has revealed to us. Obedience is often a gateway to greater understanding that brings a deeper dynamic to our faith. Will we trust him and take a step of obedience? Also, you are not here by chance, so take courage and hold on. Hold on to your faith. Hold on to God. Hold on to his word. When they announced to the people around them in their community, hey, we're going to name him John, what was the response? Hey, that's not the right thing to do. And so not everybody was pleased with their decision. Not everybody understood what they were doing. And I wonder maybe for you, if you've experienced some of that, and maybe following the Jesus of the Bible and putting your hope and trust in him has not always caused everybody to understand. And maybe you've received some pushback. Part of the Christmas story is that people who followed God disappointed some of the people around them. And that still happens. And by the way, Mary, who is the mother of Jesus, you're going to hear about her next week. You know, every indication was that this incredible, miraculous birth where she is pregnant by the Holy Spirit, people didn't believe her. And probably there are indications from later in life that she was never believed. And people assumed some very negative things about her. And maybe you've experienced some of that. You are in good company. And there's an aspect of following God that doesn't always make sense to everybody around you. Follow Jesus. And love the people around you to follow Jesus. Every step that we take closer to God is not going to be popular with everyone. Follow Jesus. At the end of this story, Zechariah is praising God. He's expressing his joy to God. And we often think that joy is a product of my circumstances. And if I could just change my circumstances, there would be a whole lot more joy. The story tells us, no, joy is not situational. It's not circumstantial. It's relational. Primarily tied to our relationship with God and the things that he is doing. And Zechariah was joyful not because he got what he wanted. He was joyful because he was a part of something so much bigger than himself. Let those difficult times cause us to really take stock of where we put our hope and what we think is our source of joy. And if we're stuck in that place, Take a step of faith, take a step of obedience, take a step of courage. Those will lead us closer to the true source of joy, which is who God is and everything that he's doing that is so much bigger than just us. Would you bow your heads together with me as I pray? Lord Jesus, we thank you for the true story of Christmas that is very human on our side of it. God, the Christmas story from your perspective just feels like this. I'm going to do it anyway, no matter what is on the other side of all that I have promised and predicted and, and just extended an invitation to be a part of. And God, from our side of it, may we know that that opportunity to respond to your invitation is still there and that there is still a way that people like us, no matter who we are and no matter where we find ourselves today, can be a part of your story. And so God, do your work in these hearts of ours and help us through this season to know um, that this is a story of your great work and our opportunity 
to be a part of what God is doing in a much, much bigger picture than we ever dreamed. And God, let that bring joy to these hearts of ours long after this story, knowing that you are who you say that you are, and you are the God who is at work today. And so God, may our hope be in you, and may it produce joy in us. We ask and pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope you enjoyed today's message. If you found this sermon meaningful, please subscribe, rate, and leave a review. Your support helps us reach more people and spread the word. Stay connected with us throughout the week by following us on social media at Washington Heights Church on Facebook and Instagram, and by visiting our website at whc.faith. For more information and additional resources, check out the podcast description below. Thank you for joining us. See you next week.